My lovely imps, it is time for us to discuss the final movie of the prequel trilogy and the last Star Wars segment of today, Revenge of the Sith. of opinions about Revenge of the Sith. However, before I give them to you, we've been doing a lot of Star Wars stuff lately, so please, please make sure that you press like and subscribe to the show because I know that you've had a good time and you want to have more of it, and I'm sure you want my Revenge of the Sith opinions. We've been doing an extended series of reviews about Star Wars for all of you uh, who might be watching this in the future, uh, make sure you go check them out. They'll be up on the channel. Uh, check out all the Star Wars reviews we've been doing because they've been really fun and we've had a great time. Uh, subscribe and like. And don't forget to support the show, of course. Now, it's time for us to discuss Revenge of the Sith. Revenge of the Sith. Revenge of the Sith. Boy, have there not been a lot of opinions over the years about Revenge of the Sith, huh? The real truth is, of course, that there is only one Revenge of the Sith that matters, and it is the Revenge of the Mama! True! Look at how, look at how, look at how sick this turned out, actually. This actually turned out so good. That is the Revenge of the True Sith. Um, but... Uh, uh, the revenge of the mama is that I am going to torture you now because my opinion about revenge of the Sith is, uh, quite complex. A lot of people really do not like revenge of the Sith. It was a very polarizing movie, even when it first came out. And that has not changed over the years. Uh, it has only gotten, uh, it has always been a highly contentious film. Some people absolutely hate it. Some people think it's the best um, of the prequel trilogy. And I actually have to say that I'm sort of trending towards closer to the side that it's the best of the prequel trilogy. Um, as you all know, I praised Phantom Menace quite highly and I absolutely despised Attack of the Clones. Attack of the Clones, in my opinion, is an absolute garbage movie. Um, that doesn't even, it, it, it should be, it should be stricken from the Star Wars record and completely remade, in my opinion. However, Revenge of the Sith is actually a good movie. Like, unironically, a, it's a good movie all around. It's a, it's a, not just a, it's not just like a decent Star Wars movie. It actually passes the bar for being a good movie. And I was really surprised by this because my memories from many years ago of watching Revenge of the Sith um, was that I didn't like it that much when I was younger. I remember just, I don't know why, I'd, I don't even remember why I didn't like it. I think it was because I was like really cringed out by certain scenes that we're going to discuss. But having just watched it literally yesterday, I actually really liked it. Um more than I thought I was going to. Um, and let me just sit, let me just start out by, uh, I mentioned in my very short review of the clone of the Jendi Tartakovsky Clone Wars cartoon, that it was very clear to me that George Lucas seemed actually inspired by that cartoon series. And I will point to that almost, that that is apparent almost immediately as the movie starts. When Revenge of the Sith begins, it starts in, it actually starts in the same battle sequence that the cartoon series ends on. The cartoon series ends on the siege of Coruscant, the invasion of Coruscant, and it starts at that almost exact point uh, where the movie begins. And the first thing that you will notice 
is that there is a bunch of different types of ships flying around. Like, immediately, you see a huge diversity of clone and, uh, and droid ships. You see a bunch of variants even between the, like, Star Destroyers and the, uh, Battle Cruisers. A, there is a ton of attention paid to the different weapon systems that are present on each of the ships. You see a particle lance. You see these big, uh, concussive cannons that use actual rounds being fired by the droids. You see, like, 16 different types of laser cannon being fired. Immediately, it's so cool. I'm like, what, what the... What what happened? And all I can point to is that, oh, they saw the Clone Wars uh, cartoon and they were like, we have to do this for our movie. We have to add what makes Star Wars awesome, which is having a bunch of cool ships, a bunch of cool aliens, a bunch of cool technology in a fantasy setting shooting around and you get to geek out about cool ship designs and stuff. And that's immediately what the movie opens with. It then proceeds to like one of the most fun, what I call like hijinks sequences in, in, in the Star Wars movies from the prequels to the sequels, there is these sort of like, uh, there's all these hijinks sequences where it's like um, they're sneaking around or they're, they're like trying to accomplish a secret mission or some things like, usually it has to do with stealth um, and uh, everyone who has just watched my review of the Attack of the Clones will recall that I absolutely hated the factory hijinks scene in uh, in uh, Attack of the Clones. But the the opening hijinks scene in in uh, Revenge of the Sith is actually really good. It's actually quite funny and well designed. There's this whole um, there's like a running joke where art where they're trying to communicate with R2, but R2 it doesn't have hands, so he can't turn he can't mute the communicator. So all the droids keep hearing R2 when they're like calling R2, they're like, R2, help us with this thing. And he can't he doesn't have hands, he can't mute the device, so the droids keep hearing him. And he has to keep getting like, like he keeps having to avoid droids while trying to help them. And they keep giving him contradictory commands. Like they're like, activate the, the elevator. And the elevator goes down really fast instead of up and they need it to go up. And so they're like, no, wait, the other way. But he's getting attacked by droids. And so he has to go do it again. And it's actually um, really funny and good. It's an actual movie scene that is actually entertaining. It is wacky and silly, but it's like, it's entertaining. And there's different types of droids that you see, and there's a cool environment. The set that they set up for uh, General Grievous' ship is very cool. Uh, is it, is that, isn't that just the same wacky shit from the previous movies, like the exact same? Not even close. And let me talk about what I, why, let me try and like communicate the difference here uh, between uh, uh, the old, the, the first two movies and this one in the first movie. Um, okay. So in attack of the clones, they go into a droid factory. The, there is, they are not engaging with anything. It is a factory. Everything is moving. It's supposed to all be automated. And for some reason they keep falling into things, even though they could literally just do anything else. They could literally just walk around it. They're not being like pursued by anybody. They just, for some reason, decide for no apparent reason to walk on a, uh, on an active assembly line for droids. They could literally jump, force jump anywhere they wanted to. They could just go onto the actual maintenance paths and never have to engage with it. But for some reason, they choose to walk on a, uh, on a, uh, uh like an assembly line. And then they're dodging like a weird arm and there's like a lava that splay, sprays at them. It's, it's like a theme park ride. Whereas in Revenge of the Sith, they're actually engaging with a pre-designed environment. They clearly sat down and said, okay, here's the environment that these characters are going to be in, and here's the challenges they have to overcome. Instead of just sort of like being put on a path where the characters aren't making any logical decisions. For example, the first in that first scene I'm discussing in Revenge of the Sith, um, they're in the elevator, and R2 starts sending the elevator in the wrong direction. And Obi-Wan says wait, we'll wait for R2 to fix it. 
We don't, we don't want to give up the element of surprise. And Anakin says, no, forget that. I'm going to cut through the roof. There's more than one way to get up an elevator shaft. So he cuts through the roof and Anakin jumps out and uh, is like trying to climb up the elevator shaft while Obi-Wan is just sort of patiently waiting inside the elevator. Um, and, uh, and, and then he's, and then of course R2 fixes the elevator, which means that Obi-Wan ends up being correct because he's sitting in the, uh, he's sitting on the inside of the thing and Anakin's trying to climb up and the, the, the elevator starts coming back up and he's like, oh crap. And he has to like do a, a whole thing to avoid his own decision in this space. So in, in Attack of the Clones, he's, all of the characters are put on a track for no real reason with obvious escape routes around them and they just go into danger for no real reason. Whereas in the the first scene of Revenge of the Sith, they are indeed engaged in wacky hijinks, but that's because they are trying to make decisions with obstacles that are put in front of them that they have to overcome. There's an elevator shaft that they have to get up, they don't have direct control, and R2 doesn't have hands, so R2 can't turn off the, the communicator. Yes, it is silly, but it's silly with with purpose and there's revelations about their characters in the entire attack of the clones factory scene you learn nothing about any of the characters because they are all just reacting to obstacles that they are engaging with for no real reason whereas in revenge of the sith you see obi-wan is patient he's more willing to wait on r2 than anakin anakin doesn't really trust r2 that much anakin just wants to get the job done so he cuts through the roof and ends up getting in trouble because he's impatient so yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff like that, but that's that that was a little bit of a long tangent. But I really wanted to explain why the first sequence of Re of uh, Revenge of the Sith works so much better, um, and uh, uh, so it goes from that scene, which is a very fun. Uh, there's like a fun wacky scene. Oh yeah, another thing too is that it's deliberately set up to get to showcase uh, the limitations of uh of uh of anakin's abilities and also how anakin and obi-wan's relationship has changed um anakin uh uh refuses to leave obi-wan behind when obi-wan is getting obi-wan's ship oh yeah you see that obi-wan is a terrible pilot first of all he's like oh i hate flying but he gets immediately hit by droids and he can't get rid of them and anakin tries to help him but actually makes things worse because anakin is of course very impatient and he actually damages obi-wan's ship worse which makes it even harder but anakin refuses to give up and make sure that his master is saved um, so you see that their dynamic has developed. You see that there is a difference in their approach to problem solving. And of course, as this scene progresses, you get to see the limits of Anakin's famous piloting ability. You'll recall that in the first movie, Phantom Menace, uh, he's been a pilot since he was like, like, a like as long as he could walk, he's been flying vessels and you see him have to pilot a crashing ship onto a runway and it's pretty cool. So you get to see all these characters showcase their abilities and the ways that they approach things differently. Uh, and I like that a lot. I think it's really cool. So the movie proceeds, of course, and uh, and uh, and then they have another interesting sequence, which is basically immediately after the opening sequence, they have this... Uh, they have this 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 mission that Obi-Wan goes on and it's actually cool. One of the first things you'll notice uh, when he goes to oh god, what's the name of the planet? Utapar? I think the planet is called Utapar. And uh, he goes out to that planet and uh, the first thing that you realize is that like they they do a prosthetic Utapau. 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 That's what it is. Um the first thing they do is they have an actual alien. They have an actual makeup uh, real prosthetics they made an actual alien guy and he looks cool and uh and i'm like damn i can't believe they actually did that i can't believe they they did they like opened the movie or like very early on in the movie they like refute what they did with clone wars which was in clone wars literally everything is cgi literally everything is cgi and it's very unfortunate uh kiati mundi oh no it's um hold on Let me see if I can find a picture of it. Yeah, it looks cool as hell. They have like four of them, actually. It's this one right here. Hold on. 
This guy. What a cool looking alien. It's super awesome. And uh, I, I'm like, damn, that's great. So there's that's one thing. But also, the other thing that's cool about uh, Revenge of the Sith. So Revenge of the Sith immediately has much cooler uh, action scenes. It has a lot more care uh, in the film. And also, the characters, it's like the characters have taken their dumb hats off. In Attack of the Clones, the characters are all just sort of like, bumbling around and they don't know what they're doing. In this movie, all of the characters act with some level of purpose. Now, I have to be clear. Um, uh, I have to be clear. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the script is still not good. Okay. The, the base, like the, the dialogue specifically is very, very weak in Revenge of the Sith. It's one of the biggest problems and it especially shows itself in the final third of the film, which we're going to talk about is where I have the most criticisms of, but the, uh, the characters and their, and their motivations make so much more sense than any action that was taken in the entirety of Attack of the Clones. Um, that doesn't mean that all of them are 100% perfect, um, but it certainly makes a lot more sense. Let me give you an example of this. Anakin is struggling with uh, with the fact that he is having premonitions of Padme's death. He's He has doubt in himself. And as a result, the um, specifically Mace Windu does not trust Anakin. Obi-Wan continues to vouch for Anakin and Yoda takes uh, Obi-Wan's word very importantly, but oh, but Yoda finds himself torn between Mace Windu, who does not trust Anakin, and Obi-Wan, who does. And of course, Yoda uh, is able to sense a great darkness inside of Anakin Skywalker. Um, and, uh, and that actually leads to a compelling struggle. And of course, there, there's all on top of all of this, Emperor Palpatine is there like basically the entire time uh, telling Anakin exactly what he wants. Now, again, like I said, the dialogue is not very good and a lot of it is genuinely cringy. Um, okay, I gotta, I'll say this now since we're talking about the dialogue before I get to some of the ones. Um, there is a there's a basically every single scene with uh with hate with uh with with Anakin and Padme is the worst. They are just so painful. And it's not because the actors did a bad job. In fact, the actors did it put their all into it. I've said this since the very the very first Star Wars review that we've done today um that uh, the actors Every single actor put their all into these films. They really did. I mean, Hayden Christensen got ripped. Hold on. Uh, hold on. Let me show you just how ripped this guy got. He actually got totally ripped for the film. Here, this is a shot from the actual movie, okay? Like, like he got ripped as hell. There's a scene where he has a nightmare and he climbs out of bed. And it's like, dude... This guy must have been prepping for this role because he is ripped as hell. And he was trying his best, but let me tell you, he was given the worst lines ever. There is a notorious scene in this film where, uh, where Anakin goes like, Padme, you're so beautiful. And then Padme says, only because I'm so in love with you, which is like, what? It doesn't even, it doesn't even, it's not even human language. And then he replies by, no, actually, it's because I'm so in love with you. And then she replies, so that means the force, so that means that you have been blinded by your love? It is the most awkward and confusing, nonsensical, inhuman script. They are trying their best. The actors are really trying to be emotive, but they have nothing to work with just nothing to work with it's it's so unfortunate because that scene is like actually so painful um over and over and over again uh 
uh, they just have these horribly wooden and and terribly written lines and the actors are doing their best to try and portray these lines but they just can't um i don't even i don't even know uh where to go it is just it is just terrible um and unfortunately a lot of the lines in the movie continue along that that pass uh the exchange between the exchanges between anakin and palpatine um while they thematically make sense like if you think about the movie outside of the conversations you're like okay anakin is tempted by the dark side he's scared that he's going to lose his wife and he's scared that he's going to lose his child uh his unborn child that's a pretty major fear it totally makes sense that he would be vulnerable to manipulation but the actual dialogue that happens between uh between palpatine and anakin is so hilarious it's like it's it, palpatine will be like anakin you know the jedi are going to betray you only my dark side powers can help you and anakin is like that's a good point I never had considered that before. I feel scared about the future. And Palpatine goes, you're scared about the future. You should embrace the dark side. It's, oh God, it is, it is incredibly, incredibly silly. It's, it's, it's genuinely that silly. And so like, this is why I say that like the plot makes sense and the politics of the film makes total sense. Uh, but the, deliver but the but the writing of the actual dialogue is just it doesn't even it doesn't it just doesn't work i know i can do a better impression but i i i have to keep it cool because there's a lot to talk about with this film um let me talk about the politics real quick because uh uh, uh let me talk about the politics real quick because one of the things I like the most about Revenge of the Sith is that it has the best politics of the prequel trilogy. Now, I've mentioned, I mentioned early on that Star Wars to its core is an anti-fascist, anti-imperial, and anti-authoritarian series as, as an, all of them. They all have that as central tenets. But Revenge of the Sith actually really goes there. Um... It brings a ton of attention. Now, the dialogue, like I said, is cringy, but uh, it deliberately, the story deliberately brings a ton of attention to how Palpatine uses genuine fears uh, to manipulate people to make decisions uh, that are out of their own interest. Um, and also how he just gaslights tons of people about using the term democracy. Now, there's something really funny. There we go, right? Perfect. Thank you, Ashmar. So Ashmar has put it put in the um in the in the chat a quote, which interestingly is a misquote. Okay, uh, people often quote the line in the film. So this is how democracy dies, with uproarious applause. That is actually not the quote. She actually says or sorry, with thunderous applause, what she actually says is, so this is how liberty dies. Now, a lot of people do not notice this because um, because we're uh, most people who are watching and reacting to this in America are also other Americans, but uh, George Lucas throughout the entire series makes a distinct distinguishment between democracy and the Republic and liberty. I mean, and I mean this, this runs through all of the films. He draws uh, the democracy and the Republic does not protect uh, the Wookiees. The Wookiees are one are portrayed continuously as one of the most heroic races and they fight both the droids and then they end up fighting the Republic and then they end up fighting the Empire. The Wookiees are not a part of this so-called democracy. They are fighting for liberty. And specifically, in Revenge of the Sith, they get really specific about this. And it's actually really, really interesting because um, Obi-Wan uh, uh, is almost like 
the biggest critique of Obi-Wan in the entire series, the most competent critique of Obi-Wan, comes in Revenge of the Sith, where he keeps talking about democracy while he isn't actually fighting for democracy. He's oh, He keeps saying, like, like I, I, I care about democracy. I care about uh, rule of law. And that leads him to his folly because he actually cares about Padme. He actually cares about, uh, about Anakin. He actually cares about what is right and what is wrong. But he's constantly bound by this, like, sort of... Uh, uh, this idea that he has to serve the Republic. And it's funny because it's deliberately, uh, he's compared to Qui-Gon multiple times. And if you'll recall from uh, from Phantom Menace, Qui-Gon explicitly disobeys the Jedi Order. He explicitly disobeys the Republic when he thinks that it is the right thing to do. So the most heroic characters through all of the prequel trilogy uh, are always the people who fight not for democracy, not for a republic, not for a state structure, but for freedom and for liberty. And it's funny that people often misremember the line as this is how democracy dies when Padme actually says this is how liberty dies. And I actually and and for this reason, I think that the revenge of the Sith is is so satisfying politically. Um, I'm going to talk about another political, uh, a piece of political imagery that a lot of people don't even realize, but that Doe pointed out to me. Uh, so there is a somewhat silly scene. Uh, let me see if I can find it real quick. Hold on. Let me see. I know I can find the screenshot. Yes. Okay, right here. Okay, this is it right here. Everybody sort of laughs at this scene, but I actually kind of like it, and I'm going to tell you why. Uh, and this is one of the problems that I got to... I'll get into this all, but hold on. Let me show you. Oh, this is a terrible quality image, okay? But whatever. Bear bear with it, okay? So there's this fight at the end of Revenge of the Sith where Yoda and, and Sidious are fighting in the Senate, okay? And Sidious is literally throwing these little pods, okay? Okay? But I want you to think about this uh, a couple of ways. So first of all, the symbol, the political symbolism is actually good. All of the silliness aside, the 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 icon of the Jedi Order, Master Yoda, and the icon of the Sith, Darth Sidious, are literally fighting in the in the seat of democracy, and Darth Sidious is grabbing the 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 representations of of peoples he's picking up the pl the podiums where people make their voices heard throughout the entire series uh you s in fact almost the only scenes that you ever see in the senate are uh are alien races basically pleading for help and usually being ignored. Remember back to Phantom when Na when uh, Qu Queen Amidala pleads the Senate for help and they're like, well, we'll have to do some paperwork. And she's like, fine then, I'm leaving. I'll go free myself. This is, in my opinion, deliberate. Very, very deliberate. I think that George Lucas actually knew what he was doing here. I think that this is actually the poetry and it does actually rhyme. Sidious is picking up the literal, the, the, uh, democratic representation of peoples and weaponizing them to destroy the Jedi Order and the Jedi Order can do nothing Yoda can do nothing but dodge them. He's crushing individual peoples, these symbols of these peoples, utilizing them as literal weapons and, and it's funny to me that people remember the line as this is how democracy dies because George Lucas actually went out of his way to make a line between democracy and liberty. That democracy often opposes liberty. That democracy is weaponized and turns into tyranny. He's, he's, yes, he's using the institutions of democracy as a weapon to destroy liberty, but he's also weaponizing and destroying the actual peoples that are supposedly supposed to be represented here. But throughout the entire series, every single scene in the Senate, the Senate 
is incapable of actually helping those people. Those people are left to fend for themselves, to bond with one another, and to liberate themselves. And this is one of the reasons why I think that the prequel trilogy is so politically based. Unfortunately, the <laughs> script is so silly that you have to dig through a bunch of like, uh, you have to dig through a bunch of cringe to get there. But unironically, the political message of all three prequel films carries through. And it's impressive. Genuinely impressive. I, I actually love the politics of these movies. And George Lucas's political opinions show through with a with a uh, with a uh, uh, a critical analysis of the films. The dialogue is 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 not good. Okay, it's really really silly. Um, but the film, uh, okay. And I want to point out, by the way, um, I want to point out also. Uh, something else, which is that, uh, and I will back this up. If you go to the original Star Wars trilogy, the original Star Wars trilogy is about, uh, is literally about uh, a ragtag band of, a of, of aliens and humans from all over the, ba of the galaxy working together to overcome an overwhelming totalizing empire. And we know explicitly in the text of the original trilogy, and of course now we know with the prequels as well, that the Empire grew seamlessly out of the Republic. George Lucas has written a anti-authoritarian, anti-state manifesto, and he disguised it as cringy space space wizards. Also, he explicitly says that the, uh, that the Empire is America uh, in one of the funniest uh, interviews I've ever seen. There's multiple points throughout the series where uh, his politics show through. Uh, yes, uh, exactly. Mother Mirset says the I am the Senate. Um, oh, oh yeah, yeah, hold on real quick to build off of that. The I am the Senate um, line. There's another line that people overlook in uh, Revenge of the Sith that I really like. Um, and it is, uh, it's, it's an argument between Anakin and Obi-Wan. And Anakin says, um, you're asking me, uh, so Obi-Wan asks Anakin to spy on Chancellor Palpatine, Supreme Chancellor Palpatine, uh, on behalf of the Jedi Council. And Anakin is very troubled by this. Anakin says, you're asking me to betray the Senate. And then Obi-Wan replies, no, I'm asking you to betray, I'm asking you to, uh, he says, he says, uh, sorry, how does he word it? He says, the head of the Senate is not the same thing as the Senate. And it's, it's, so good uh uh it's really really fantastic uh that they they draw the conclusion between like this guy and and also he, he's correct though like obi-wan is kind of wrong here because sidious is right he is the senate he commands complete control over the senate this supposedly democratic body that regularly ignores the needs of the of the of the weakest members in its body uh, he has complete command over and seamlessly, easily seizes command of it. Obi-Wan is, is like incorrect in, in, I mean, he's correct in his motivations. Uh, he's correct to say that, yes, you should spy on Sidious and Sidious isn't the Senate, isn't, isn't really the same thing as the Senate, but he's wrong in his, in having a very childish view of democracy. He still believes that like this, that even though he has witnessed every person that he cares about be ignored or run over by the Galactic Senate. He still tries to believe that there's this ideal there. And there's another thing that I think this is, um, this is, uh, is kind of, um, important to denote, which is that, uh, uh, Obi-Wan is, like I said before, the Revenge of the Sith directly critiques Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan keeps in, like he keeps invoking democracy and he keeps pretending that he believes in democracy and all the and the republic and all this stuff. But there's a scene in which he's offered the ability to go and and spend time with the politicians and he and he explicitly says, 
I don't want anything to do with the politics. He actually can't stand spending time with the politicians. And repeatedly throughout both Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith, Obi-Wan warns Anakin that politicians are not to be trusted because they're more, con they're more uh, interested in their own power. So Obi-Wan doesn't believe in democracy. Obi-Wan is actually, in truth, he's more like uh, he's more like uh, Qui-Gon, but he hasn't actually embraced that yet. He hasn't actually come to that point. He's still fooled, um, as are many of the other Jedi, as it turns out. The Jedi Order itself was willing to buy into the same lies that ultimately doomed them. Their dogma, their insistence on following the letter of the law in all cases leads to their own demise. He's a liberal, yeah. But also, so is Yoda. And so is ev basically everyone. Almost the entire Jedi Order. They are too invested in their own power. And it's funny because Sidious is correct in like a in a in i almost i almost made i almost cringed by saying like he's correct in a trumpian way where uh where sidious is pointing at something that people feel is true which is the fact that the jedi order is too invested in their own power but of course like he's no better uh he's it, he's literally like i'm just gonna take full power and turn it into the empire but he's not incorrect in pointing out that the jedi order is objectively uh more they are invested in the exact structure that will ultimately destroy them. The entire trilogy kind of talks shit on Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan is a bit of a narcissist who thinks he's some great leader for being the mentor of Anakin, who he religiously believed to be the one from prophecy. I read it slightly differently. Um, Obi-Wan is somebody who is very, very good at heart. He genuinely, truthfully believes in Anakin, but he... he but, but Obi-Wan does not have the wisdom of Qui-Gon. Qui-Gon was willing to defy the letter of the law in order to ensure that Anakin got trained because Qui-Gon believed in Anakin. Obi-Wan has to find justifications within the system. Every time, every single point of the movies, Obi-Wan has to find a justification. Oh, it's because he's the chosen one. He brings it up multiple times. In truth, Obi-Wan just loves Anakin. Obi-Wan is Anakin's number one cheerleader. Even, even though he's sarcastic and not a very good teacher for a lot of the, especially in Attack of the Clones, and even at some points in, in, uh, in Revenge of the Sith, Obi-Wan's biggest flaw is that he's not honest with himself. He can't, he can't see within himself until it's too late. Obi-Wan constantly has to justify himself to the council in a way that Qui-Gon never did. And the movies bring attention to the differences between Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon. There's even a scene in Attack of the Clones, I think it is in Attack of the Clones, where uh, An Anakin says, you're no Qui-Gon. And Obi-Wan knows he's not Qui-Gon. He knows he's not as wise as Qui-Gon. That Qui-Gon had a conviction of his, to his principles. That Qui-Gon did not justify everything he did via dogma. That he justified it with his own belief system, with his own feelings and his own genuinely held beliefs. So I don't know if I would. I don't know if I would agree that um, that. Uh, uh, I don't know if I would agree that that uh, Obi-Wan is a narcissist. I don't actually think he is. I think that he is dealing with somebody who is, uh, uh, he's dealing with a destiny that is greater than him and not doing a very good job of it, but he's trying his best. And I find, and Obi-Wan is a genuinely compassionate and good person who is trapped in literally liberalism. If you want to be completely literal about it, he's he is trapped in a liberal worldview. He is trapped in the same dogma we just see we see the jedi order sort of embodied in in uh in both yoda and in obi-wan in different ways yoda is sort of like the the symbol the visual symbol of the jedi order but obi-wan is the character that we actually get to know um so i i like that part Anyway, that was the long politics part that I mentioned that we're going to be discussing as we go through the Star Wars series. Uh, but I have more to say about Revenge of the Sith. Um, <sighs> Revenge of the Sith. We have to talk about the last third of the film now. Um, 
uh, Xerox 13 star. Maybe I just see my religious mother in him. He's high on his own self-righteousness and treats Anakin like he'll never reach his level or gain his approval. Um, I think that's true in Attack of the Clones, but I don't think that's true in Revenge of the Sith or in the Clone Wars um, cartoon. Um, I will say that in Attack of the Clones, they they wrote uh, they wrote Obi Wan uh, as an as a jerk. Basically, I think Obi Wan in in Attack of the Clones is insufferable, and I think it was unintentional because in uh, the Clone Wars show, he regularly praises and and builds up. Um, builds up uh, Anakin. And also in Revenge of the Sith, there are multiple scenes where it explicitly shows in private Obi-Wan uh, 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 fighting to have, uh, to give Anakin a seat. Like Obi-Wan advocates for uh, Anakin to become a Jedi Master when the rest of the council does not agree with it. But he ultimately cedes to the rules. When Yoda and the others outvote him, he doesn't protest. He just goes, okay, well, the rules are the rules. And then he tells Anakin to wait on it. It's the, I actually think that the writing, even if some of the, even if Attack of the Clones kind of sucks and I had my reasons for disliking that movie a lot, I think that in Revenge of the Sith, they, they like the writing is actually very careful to show that Obi-Wan does support Anakin multiple times, um, but that he's too bound by the rules, that he's not able to become Qui-Gon because Qui-Gon would have broken the rules. Qui-Gon would have protested. Qui-Gon would have said, if you don't give Anakin the, the mastership, I'm not going to participate in the council. He would have protested. But Obi-Wan was too weak to do so. Obi-Wan is literally stuck in proceduralism, which uh, I will I will argue that this is very deliberate because that is the message of the rest. Of, like, that's a part of the rest of the movie. Um, the proceduralism of the Senate uh, is 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 part of the reason why uh, the people of Naboo almost get genocided. Like, there's so much that draws to the attention to that. It makes sense that Obi-Wan would also, like, that he thematically struggles with that. So, so Mama, are you telling me that the prequels are about a lib being a bad parent raising a person that was co-opted by fascists and democracy is different from freedom? Pretty close. Yeah, more or less. Um, and in fact, in, uh, oh yeah, hold on. I have another point to this that I want to, I, another piece of supporting evidence, okay? which is um, in Phantom Menace, when, uh, when they bring, when Qui-Gon brings Anakin in front of the Jedi Council. So let's, let's get the context. Let's, let's, memorize, let's re remember the context of this. Um, in Phantom Menace, uh, Qui-Gon brings Anakin in front of the Council after freeing him from slavery, and he has to leave his mom behind because, of course, Watto will not let Shmi Skywalker go free. So... Uh, so he has to leave his mom in order to pursue his destiny. Um, and, uh, uh, and when, when Qui-Gon brings him in front of the Jedi Council, he says, I want to train him. Obi-Wan is ready to become a Jedi Knight. I want to train Anakin. And Yoda and Mace Windu and Ki Adi Mundi, they all go, well, we sense fear in this young one. He's too old. Uh, he's too old. And we sense fear inside of him. And uh, they tell him that he needs to overcome his fear. He's a 10-year-old child, a 10-year-old child who has only ever known slavery and just have had to leave his mom. And the Jedi Council is so blind and unempathetic. Qui-Gon is not. Qui-Gon continues to train him in defiance of the Jedi Order. He literally trains him regardless of what the Jedi Order said. But the Jedi Order is so proceduralistic, they're so dogmatic, that they're literally unable to see why a child might be afraid. They don't even give him a drop of charity, of, of, of care or healing or, or comfort or, or anything. They just say, you're not good enough for us. You're not pure enough for us. the the politics of uh, the politics of of the the tre of the prequels are very consistent throughout with the uh with some i mean honestly the politics aren't particularly damaged by attack of the clones attack of the clones just is a bad movie and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense um yeah and uh the, the obi-wan being a bad parent obi-wan is an unprepared parent 
uh, and he has no assistance. Uh, Obi-Wan is left to be in charge of the supposed chosen one and Yoda and, and Mace Windu and Ki-Adi Mundi and, uh, Floppo Dapo and, uh, Grito Bogongo, uh, they are completely uncaring. Uh, they, they, they literally, I mean, it's funny because, um, notice, notice that, that Yoda has to go into exile for like 17 years because of how poorly he fails. Yoda fails and he loses to Emperor Palpatine. Yoda is the wisest and most powerful member of the Jedi Council and he fails because he has become so blinded that he can't even see a Sith Lord under his own nose. And, uh, and, 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 and so, I, I have I guess I have a sympathetic view for Obi-Wan because uh, I think that there is a through line of Obi-Wan genuinely trying his best and having basically no assistance in that. Uh, Obi-Wan, Qui-Gon is killed before Obi before he's able to finish his training. Uh, the Jedi Council is blind. They're bl literally blinded by their dogma, and he has he has been tasked with training the chosen one without having even gotten to have closure with his own master. Yeah. Yeah. Obi Wan never full never completed his training. He, he I mean he he uh, Qui Gon believed him to be worthy of becoming a Jedi Knight, but Qui Gon died early. I think Yoda was, I, I mean, I think Obi-Wan was trying his best. I just think that he's flawed. And I think that, uh, that, uh, right, that, uh, Revenge of the, uh, Revenge of the Sith, uh, like redeems his character to a certain degree. And it actually connects very well with his character, um, in, uh, in, the the original trilogy because in the original trilogy we see him make up for the failures of his past he refuses to give up on luke uh he trains luke to the best of his ability he's very supportive of luke and he protects luke to the best of his ability literally giving his own life uh to ensure that luke is able to carry on so yeah i i i tend to think you know i try to be I try to have a, uh, I don't know, I have a charitable look towards Obi-Wan, and I think the films do as well, at least from what I can tell. Now, we have to talk now. I, I said I was going to talk about it before, but we have to talk now about the final third of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, of Revenge of the Sith. Because, uh, boy, do they bungle that last bit of the movie, okay? Uh, the last bit of the film is rough in a lot of ways. And the final, like, the last, like, 30 minutes is the is really, really rough. Um, and it, it, there's so many strange decisions. It starts to feel like Attack of the Clones again. Um... Uh, uh, it's, it's okay. So where do I start? So first of all, remember how I mentioned in a, at the end of the attack of the clones review that, uh, time stopped, like, like interstellar time stops mattering at all. It's, it, it goes to an absurd level in, in the end of rise of Skywalker or in the end, I almost said rise of Skywalker in the end of revenge of the Sith, revenge of the Sith. Oh my dear God. There's a part where, uh, Mustafar, which is stated as like an outer, outer rim planet. Uh, uh, Anakin goes to Mustafar to kill a bunch of Confederate, a uh, bunch of Confederate system leaders. And in the time it takes him to lightsaber a bunch of unarmed guys and then make a phone call, uh, uh, Padme and Obi-Wan are able to travel all the way from Coruscant to Mustafar conveniently just in time uh, at in the time it takes for him to make a phone call. Unironically, he's shown killing the people and then immediately making a phone call to Palpatine. There is no depicted time between this. And in that time, uh, they arrive from Coruscant to an outer rim world. Like I said, time stops mattering. And additionally, what's even worse is that 
through ri uh, Revenge of the Sith appears to take place over the course of a few days um, is what it seems like the timeline is. But at the beginning of the movie, Padme it does not look pregnant at all. She's not showing her pregnancy even a little bit. And she tells Anakin, I'm pregnant. And then the events occur and she, she's, she has the baby like within what appears to be days. Maybe months, but it, but you, it is almost impossible to tell because what you see is events that appear to be happening in rapid succession. I don't think that's true. It could be months, but it doesn't appear like that. And and let me tell you, if you go watch the film, you will have a very hard time portraying the past or, or uh, uh, documenting the passage of time because they move from conversations and characters. I mean, there's a part in the movie where uh, where you see in real time Obi Wan light speed travel to another planet. And then they, and then he fights Grievous in a, a real time fight. He's fighting Grievous for like 30 minutes or so as literally they're actually fighting for like over a course of like maybe 30 in world minutes. And the moment that he kills Grievous, he, it's, he tells that to the council and the council, uh, tells, uh, Emperor Palpatine. And Emperor, and in between that time, you see Anakin have a conversation with Padme, and Padme gets more pregnant. So the time, tr the time issue is complete. It's totally impossible to follow. This thread explains it. It takes over, f takes place over five days. Okay, this is actually super interesting here. I made a rough timeline of Revenge of the Sith. I'm not really sure why. I think it helps the viewing experience. All times are relative to Coruscant. I realize no times or even spaces between the events are 100% canon, but I like it. Day one, Obi-Wan and Anakin launch their rescue plan for Palpatine. They arrive on the flagship. They engage Dooku. Jedi, Jedi and Palpatine are recaptured. Grievous abandons the ship. Padme and Anakin talk on the, on the balcony. That night, Anakin has his dream about Padme's death and discusses it with her. And by the way, this makes sense because, because she, he goes to her house, they have a conversation and she's no more pregnant. Like these things are, again, the visual time telling is totally messed up because like this happens and events that they say are supposed to be happening in short periods of time do happen and you see them happen and you see him walk in and there's no room for a time skip. Anakin has his dream. Palpatine meets with Anakin. Anakin attends the council meeting in which he's denied the rank. Then Obi-Wan tells Anakin of his new assignment. Yoda, Mace, and Obi-Wan discuss the assignment, and he leaves for Kashyyyk. The Battle of Kashyyyk begins. All of these check out. Moody Mara. Uh, Moody Mara says, Biology in Star Wars is very loose. After all, humans and aliens can have children together. It's best not to get too hung up on it. That's true. I recognize that there is there is there is like uh, artistic license, but the reason why I'm bringing attention to this is because I think it's unfortunate. Um, <clears throat> the fact that uh, interstellar travel stops taking time, that everything happens just in time, that everybody arrives just in time, that uh, people teleport over to other people's, uh, you know. Uh, places it makes the universe less enjoyable. That's the re that's my complaint. Obviously, I'm fixating a little bit here to try and get generate the truth because people said that I was wrong to say that it takes place over the course of days. But uh, my genuine perception from the events of the movie is that it appears to take place over a couple of days. Yeah. So anyway, I think it makes the series weaker. Uh, so that's one thing. Um, and then there is just a bunch of very silly decisions. The Obi-Wan and Anakin final confrontation on Mustafar is an incredibly silly and, in my opinion, pretty stupid fight. Um, while the whole thing isn't terrible, most of it is really cheesy CG. And also, uh, 
it 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 becomes so melodramatic it's unbelievable there's a part in the fight in the in the fight of revenge of the sith where they're swinging like uh like tarzan on ropes and when they pass each other they're trying to hit each other with their lightsabers it is it is beyond uh beyond cartoony uh it is hilariously cartoony and i think it really undersells the seriousness of the moment because i mean keep in mind that when they have their lightsaber fight at the end uh, uh anakin has just choked padme padme gets choked he chokes his wife he goes crazy with the dark side and and fulfills his own worst nightmare his 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 vision comes true you know what's the what's the uh, the saying a man often meets his destiny on the path that he took to avoid it and then they just have a extremely silly goose uh, a sword fight on Mustafar, and it's unfortunate. It is very unfortunate. Oh yeah, they miss each other a whole bunch intentionally. Very silly. Uh, I will say that the final speech was good. I actually think that the final speech is pretty decent. When he uh, has the high ground, everybody memes on the high ground, and then he cu cuts him up and he's like, you're my brother, you were supposed to bring balance. I actually think that's a pretty good scene, and Ewan McGregor is acting his heart out. Again, I will say it yet again, the actors for this series, unironically, uh, uh, just do so, so well. Uh, they are really, really trying their best. Ewan McGregor absolutely earned his paycheck. Uh, and uh, I'm trying to think. Oh, yeah. And then, of course, there's the final moment of the film, which the Darth Vader reveal. The Darth Vader reveal is so bad. <laughs> It's so bad. It's so bad. And I don't know. Everybody jokes about the no. And it is awful. The lines, it is very clear that they edited the lines really heavily. And I don't know why they put in the, the, the no. Because the dialogue that proceeds before it doesn't even make sense. And also, um... They have this really funny thing where Darth Vader's like chained up in the bed and he just goes like, kh, kh, and he goes like, no, and he looks like a, like a crappy robot. It is so unintentionally bad. Oh God. It's so, it's so terrible. I, I feel like they just, I don't even know. I don't even know what they, I don't know what they told James Earl Jones. I don't know what they were trying to do. It is there's, it's funny because there's an actual place where they could have ended the film way better, okay? So there's the surgery. You see him being in agony going like, oh, oh, he's getting tortured by having his suit put on. And then they have the, the helmet come down and it seals onto his head and it makes like a noise and it goes like, bum, 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 bum. End the movie right there. That's where they should have ended the movie. When they put the helmet on, he's sealed into his fate. It, it even makes sense on a visual. It makes sense on a visual, uh, a poetic. It's it's perfect. But instead, they proceed to have all of these goofy ass scenes afterwards, like the delivering the babies to crappy looking CGI sets. Um, they have the, the Padme's dramatic and embarrassing death, where she's like. Anakin still has good inside of him. Oh, and then she just dies. It's why it, it's so goofy. It's also the no. I just don't get it. Uh, it's so it's all bad and then there's another thing which is um they have a conversation between for some reason they have this conversation between obi-wan and yoda um wait for real 
Oh, yeah, yeah, I meant the delivery in the delivery room. Yeah, I meant the delivery of the delivery room. Um, okay, so there is one thing. I do like the, the midwife bot. The midwife bot is actually cute, and the doctor bot is actually cute. I like those two, but that's it. Uh, there's also this weird scene with Obi-Wan and Yoda, and Obi-Wan goes, uh, Yoda's like, we must, uh, separate the children, must we? Uh, uh, safer be they will, and uh, and then Obi Wan's like, yeah, I'll go put I'll go put the boy child with his family on Tatooine, and you just go, wait a minute, why, why, just just it it's like a lampshade is what it is. It feels like a lampshade where it's just like, why would you ever do that? Are you seriously trying to tell me that Darth Vader would never check his his family back on Tatooine for the missing babies or something? It's confusing. And 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 it it feels very lampshady and and unnecessary. They literally could have just ended the film with Anakin being sealed into the Darth Vader thing. I don't get it. So, yeah. Uh, the end of Revenge of the Sith, unfortunately, is a is a bit of a bungle. Um, the rest of Revenge of the Sith is pretty solid. Revenge of the Sith has the best action sequences uh, and battle sequences of the entire of the entire prequel trilogy. And I have to say, even though the ending is bungled, um, even though the ending is bungled, uh, uh, um. Uh, it's still a really good movie and the politics of it are based and look at how much we had to talk about. There was so much good stuff for me to say about revenge of the Sith. Um, if you haven't seen these movies in a long time and you think that maybe I'm not being accurate about how much fun I had watching revenge of the Sith, watch the prequels and then watch revenge of the Sith. Revenge of the Sith is the most competent of the prequel trilogy. It is the, it is the best, it is the best movie out of all three. Now, for a number of reasons, I am very partial to Phantom Menace because there was a lot of stuff that I liked that they were doing in Phantom Menace. But I still think, I actually, I think that by the end of it, Revenge of the Sith is just overall the best of the prequel trilogy. Um, even if I say that with some caveats. Um, uh, yeah. You think the ending was done well? I just don't think it was. I think it was very goofy and it felt rushed. The rest of uh, the rest of Revenge of the Sith was like taking its time and and setting up all of the like uh, the the visual and political storytelling. Um, and yeah. Anyway, uh, Revenge of the Sith really uh, the best of the prequel trilogy, and now. And uh, that's what I have to say about Revenge of the Sith. That's what I have to say about the entire prequel trilogy and the cartoon. Next, I will be watching the original trilogy. So look forward on a future stream to have reviews for each of the uh, original trilogy films. I will not be doing them all back to back to back like I did today. Uh, I did that because I've been on vacation and I really wanted to talk about all these movies that I watched and I didn't want to spread them out over a couple of days. But now I have three videos to post about Star Wars.